everybody, and welcome to a very busy Tuesday. Dan is doing election. There's a snowstorm in the Northeast, and there are just massive developments and a bunch of big true crime stories. It's why my hair is a mess. So let's just start here. Uh, we've been waiting for six months for some kind of news in the Rachel Morin murder. The Maryland mother of five who was murdered on the Ma and Pa Trail because she went out for a run. And then the next day she was found in a way they won't even describe to us, in a way they won't even tell us, she died. They won't say how she was murdered. They won't say what the murderer did. All they'll say is that this murderer has got to be caught because he's going to do it again. They've gone so far as to say they think he's going to be a serial killer because they said they found him through DNA connected to an attack on a kid in her home in Los Angeles. And today we're finding out he didn't just attack the kid. He attacked a whole bunch of people in that home. And that had perhaps that many people not been in the home, the L.A. story might have been exactly the same as the Maryland story. What does this mean? And why is it that it's six months since Rachel Morin was killed that we're only now getting the sketch? I have a lot of questions, and I'm not so sure the answers they gave us today satisfy. I want you to be the judge of it, though. Once we break it all down, I'm going to give you all of the new information as well. The lead investigator on the case is going to be here tonight. Rachel Morin's brother will also be with us tonight. Um, and then in the Vince McMahon story, it's the story that just keeps giving. I don't want to call it the gift that keeps giving because it's gross. The allegations against Vince McMahon are gross. They're like Roger Ailes gross. They're like Harvey Weinstein gross. Jeffrey Epstein gross. The allegations are disgusting. Not just rape and sex trafficking and sex assault and pimping out some of the staff members who are female to try to juice the contracts for the upcoming wrestlers. Not just, not just those allegations, but the kinds of things that he allegedly texted he wanted to do. And then the reports of the things he did do, like defecating on one woman's head during a sex act on someone else. Well, guess what? It turns out there's some pretty big name wrestlers who say this isn't even the worst. And one of those wrestlers is joining me tonight. He says he knows the secret. He says it's big, not just big, massive. It's like the other shoe to drop, but it is a colossal boot up the you know what. That'll be in just a few moments. And also, if the end of the world is coming, do you know where you're going to go? Uh, whether it's, you know, a nuclear war or whether it's, you know, just a massive invasion or whether it's the zombie apocalypse, whatever it is, pick your battle. Where are you going to ride it out? Because there is one man who is selling right out shelters to the very, very wealthy. And can I just say, for the folks who can afford it, they are going to survive the end of times in style. I just don't know what they're going to do with all their money after. Or maybe the money will come in handy. I don't know what they're thinking, but here's what I do know. The bunkers are insane. Like, amazing. Like, I don't even think you can find a hotel room this nice. And our Brian Enton got a ticket to ride. He's going to sleep in one of those bunkers tonight. He's joining me live. He's going to show you what it looks like inside one of these survivalist bunkers. But let's start here. It has been now more than six months since the name Rachel Morin first showed up in our headlines and not for anything good. She was a 37-year-old mother of five, went for a Sunday run on a popular Maryland trail, and never got to come home. Her boyfriend reported her missing on August 5th, and her body was found the next day in a drain culvert. She had been violently murdered, but police have never said exactly how. They withhold a lot of details about this crime. But a few weeks later, they seem to get a big break because DNA from Rachel's murder matched an assailant who had attacked a young girl in her home in Southern California a few months earlier. And that man uh, was even seen on a doorbell video, kind of, like they caught this image of him from the back, but they did not catch him. No suspect has been caught or named. There isn't even a sniff, it seems. So now investigators are hoping to generate new leads by releasing new information and some brand new, highly detailed sketches. Suspect is believed to be Hispanic between 20 and 30 years old, about 5 feet 9 inches tall, 160 pounds. The investigators now say he assaulted not only 
the young girl in the L.A. home, but several other people in that home as well. It's the first time we've actually even heard there were more than a few people in the home, multiple people, certainly the first time that we were told they were also assaulted by this guy. The cops say that the attack in that Los Angeles home could have turned out to be the same thing that Rachel Morin suffered in Maryland. Here is what Chef, uh, Sheriff Jeffrey Goller of Harford County, Maryland, told News Nation's Nicole Burley earlier today. But I do think had he had more opportunity there, it would have been a worse crime scene there, similar to what we um, are investigating in Rachel's case. And, uh, you know, uh, no people, no individuals uh, here, there, or anywhere deserve their life to be ended in such a way. You know, Rachel was a young mom, five children, um, uh, you know, mom, sister, brother still, um, and, and looking for answers, looking for this person. I, I have no doubt in my mind, I've been doing this 40 years. If this guy is not caught, he will do it again. We have also learned that the red Air Jordan hat that you see in the, the sketch there, the one that was left behind in the L.A. attack, that's where police actually got the DNA from the hat. That, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, we know that the suspect also was not wearing that hat, obviously, because it was left in the home, but was wearing maybe a similar hat, a similar baseball hat, when he attacked Rachel in Maryland. Rachel's family has tried everything to identify this killer. They have delivered more than 10,000 flyers door to door in L.A., and they printed them in both Spanish and English, just hoping for any kind of small clue. The authorities have interviewed more than 100 people. They've dug through 1,000 tips, and still there is no one in custody. Joining me now exclusively is Rachel Morin's brother, Michael Morin. Michael, thank you for, uh, for being on tonight. Again, I can't tell you how sorry I am to, to you know, know what you and your family are, are going through, and I can't even know the half of it. But this has to feel good that at least there's a sketch that's out there publicly. I am personally troubled. It's taken six months. I would love to know what your family thinks about that delay. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think there's a reason behind uh, releasing the sketch, like uh, the sheriff has said, um, you know, making sure it looks, uh, you know, very similar to the uh, the guy. Um, you know, six, six months is a long time, and a lot of people, you know, they say time heals. Uh, but in this wound, you're not having, uh, you know, him captured uh, it's like bacteria and it's been festering so it's it's you know compounded the uh, the grief for our family and speaking of that i i can only imagine that at least the police are you know keeping regular contact with you i would hope that that's what's happening what is the latest that that you know do you know more than we know and are you in regular contact with the investigators yeah, um, you know, I haven't been in as much contact as I was initially. Uh, you know, I knew a lot of the information that came out in the sheriff's podcast. Um, I didn't know about the hat. That was new information for us. Um, so, it, but we, you know, there, there is some information that we have that a lot of other people do not have, um, you know, speaking to, uh, you know, witnesses and and uh, other people so is there is that information you can share with me tonight no unfortunately this is something that you shared with the with the police though yeah i mean the police are um you know aware of uh, this information and is this does this pertain to witnesses in in maryland or witnesses in la yeah in uh, maryland have you and your family ever been successful in trying to at least track down the home where that assault happened? Because I, I feel like that was part of the strategy, was to try to identify what home that might have been. Yeah, I mean, you know, some Internet sleuths have, you know, found the address pretty uh, early on in the investigation. And that was kind of public knowledge, um, you know, weeks uh, after my sister's murder. So... Did, did you make any contact with the people in that home? No, did not. Um, you know, it, my understanding it involved a minor and, um, 
you know, I just wanted to kind of stay away from that situation and give them their privacy. One of the other uh, revelations today was that the sheriff in the case said that it is possible that this killer may have actually been stalking Rachel or at least may have had an eye uh, out for her prior. But he thinks that if they catch this killer, that roads will lead back to some connection. What do you know about that? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't think there's any definitive uh, evidence pointing to the fact that uh, he did stalk my sister leading up to her murder. Um, and likewise, I don't think that there's any evidence, uh, you know, to say that's not true. Um, so it would just be speculation. Uh, but I, one thing I do know is... Are you... Yeah, he, one thing I do yeah, know ahead. is uh, he went there uh, with the purpose of killing someone. You know, whether he planned it, planned on my sister or not, I, I don't know. And, and Michael, how do you know that? Uh, you know, information, uh, you know, that would lead me to that, you know, conclusion, which I don't believe I'm allowed to uh, discuss. Did the killer have a particular kind of weapon? Uh, that I'm not aware of. So, but I mean, Sheriff Gaylor so it's, had yeah, made uh, a few statements, uh, you know, about the brutality of the attack over in Los Angeles, you know, that it wasn't a sexual assault, but it was an assault, and that he was led to believe that if, uh, you know, the suspect wasn't, interrupted that, uh, you know, they would have ended up the same as my sister. Uh, so that leads me to believe that, uh, you know, there is a correlation, uh, you know, to that, have it be a particular weapon used uh, or not. Did this killer uh, sexually assault Rachel? <sighs> um, that is something I uh, also can't uh, say. It's a very hard question to ask of, of a family member, and I'm so sorry for that. It just seems so perplexing to everyone who's trying to find this man, why there's so many details cloaked in secrecy. Is there anything you can tell me to sort of help me understand why they're keeping so many of these details to their vest when in other similar crimes that they're trying to solve? Um, they, they don't. They, they, it's just, it's not usually this um, difficult to, to, to learn these details. Yeah, unfortunately, that, you know, that's a question I can't answer. Um, you know, I mean, it, it has been six months. And, you know, at some point, um, you know, I think it would be time to be the squeaky wheel. I'm not sure if uh, now is that time. Um, but, yeah, I don't know why they're holding uh, so much evidence uh, close to the best. Michael, is it frustrating to you? Yeah, I mean, it can be very frustrating, um, you know, but just got to be patient. Understand. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a circumstance none of us can imagine um, what it's like to be in. And, and my prayers are going out to you and your family and certainly to everybody uh, that this killer be brought in and brought to justice. Certainly in the name of justice, but also so that he doesn't do it to anyone else. Michael Morin, thank you so much. And stay in touch with us and keep us apprised. Thank you. And we'll keep this story in the, in, the, um, in the press as well because it can only help to generate tips. That's what we hope. Joining me now is Captain Andrew Lane. He is the commander of the criminal division for the Harford County Sheriff's Office, and he's overseeing the Rachel Morin investigation. Um, Captain Lane, thank you for being on tonight. I appreciate it. I'm going to ask the same question that I, that I asked of, um, of Michael, and that is, why is everything so secret? Uh, I, I covered this. You know, I, I do cr true crime for a living. And not many cases are cloaked in this much secrecy as this one. And I only imagine that the more details that are out there can help to generate um, leads and tips. I also understand keeping things close to the vest, but there's a healthy balance. No, I agree with that, ma'am. There is a healthy balance. I think we've uh, spoken openly about uh, the crime scene. We've recently released a sketch um, that you showed there at the beginning. Uh, I think we've uh, been open with the public, but there are certain details uh, of the case that is at this point we're not prepared to discuss. 
The, the fact that the sketch is coming out now and the Air Jordan hat, these are such incredibly helpful details. It shouldn't take six months to, um, to coalesce the number of witnesses on the East Coast and West Coast to come to an agreement on details of the person they believe they saw. It shouldn't take six months. I understand it's not immediate, but why six months? Is it, I mean, is it at all possible that this killer has raped and were murdered again in those six months while perfection was being sought in releasing a sketch? I don't think it was perfection we were seeking, ma'am. I think what we were trying to do was, yes, locate witnesses here in the East Coast, which we didn't uh, locate all of them immediately, and then also uh, use witnesses on the West Coast along with the video that we have to try to come up with uh, the most exact sketch that we could. What we didn't want to do was release multiple sketches of the same suspects. We wanted the public to be able to see the best image that we could possibly come up with uh, when we released it. Also, one of the details that you released today was that uh, multiple people in the L.A. home had been assaulted. Is it fair to say, and, and, and not only that, but that the killer of Rachel Morin did not enter the L.A. home through the front door? Is it fair to say the killer came through another egress, perhaps a window, and that other members of the family or other people in that home in L.A. fought with that suspect and scared him off i i'm not going to comment exactly how he entered the home but yes he didn't uh enter the front door of the home he came through uh another entrance and uh yes it would be fair to say that um there was a, um, obviously a confrontation in the home which said the people were assaulted um, before he left can you go into a little more detail about that was this her family that heard her cry for help? Was it late at night? Was it in the middle of the night? Just, it's, you have to understand, if you're looking for someone, you have to help the public help you. And so it helps to know the MO of, of someone like this. Sure, I understand that. I can't go into a lot of details because it's still an active investigation for the Los Angeles Police Department, but I can say that I think by looking at the video, as you discussed, it happened during the evening hours, that he didn't enter the home um, through the front door and that he assaulted people when he uh, was inside the home. It uh, doesn't feel like I got any further there. Did he have a weapon? I, I can't really discuss that. Was there a similar MO in what happened in the L.A. house to what happened to Rachel out on the Ma and Pa trail? Uh, I, I can't discuss that too much. I would say, you know, similarities. Obviously, people were attacked in the home. Uh, it was a violent encounter, and obviously the incident that happened here uh, shares those similarities. One last question. The, um, the, the Air Jordan hat, that doesn't seem like a detail that would be difficult to come to agreement on. Um, why did you not release the detail of the Air Jordan hat? It's been six months. It's been, it's, it's been longer than six months with the attack in L.A., why did we not at least have that so that we had that to go on as the public looking for this killer? Well, I think, as you mentioned, the hat obviously was recovered at the scene there. We don't believe he's still in possession of the hat now. Uh, we included the hat in the sketch Wh because witnesses, we knew he was Witnesses could have seen someone who, you know, so witnesses could have seen someone in that neighborhood wearing that very specific hat. Why did you not release that information about the hat to the public? I don't know that the hat, because it's a common style, that specific hat necessarily would have would have helped anyone in that instance. Um, it was several months when Rachel's incident happened after the incident in L.A. I think the fact that he wears uh, a hat similar in style could be helpful, and that's why we released it at this time. But it's six months later. That's what I'm asking. It's been six months. We could have used this for the last six months. It could have could have generated leads. It could have generated tips. Memories fade. Who knows if anybody remembers where they were six months ago? And when the, yes, I understand the point you're making, man, but we felt like the, the best impact we could have is, is now, and that's why we released it now. Well, I hope you'll release more uh, so that we can keep this story alive and help the Marin family bring this man to justice and help anybody else out there who may be victimized by this person because your own boss has said he's going to do it again. Your own boss has said that they think that, you know, the sheriff thinks that this is a serial killer and that someone else could be uh, in grave risk. So uh, let's talk again, shall we? Yes, ma'am. Captain Andrew Lane, um, commander of the
criminal division for the Harford County Sheriff's Office, uh, office overseeing the Rachel Morn investigation. Um, I don't usually do politics on this show, but this is Tuesday, and a very big race has just been called. Believe it or not, uh, this is a race, weirdly, that intersects with true crime. So it's the special election in New York for the congressional seat that was briefly held by George Santos, who you know, even if you don't follow politics. If you watch SNL, you know. That was the Republican who was expelled months ago, um, or months after being indicted. There's the intersection with true crime. Uh, the voters in Queens, parts of Long Island, uh, had to brave a massive snowstorm today just to get to the polls. And our decision desk has just called the winner. Um, it is the Democrat, actually, Tom Swosey, a three-term veteran of that very seat. This uh, represents a key pickup for the Dems. This is a tough loss for Republicans who are eager to keep their razor-thin House majority from getting any thinner. Santos became, of course, a punchline for his outlandish lies some of which formed the basis of almost two dozen felony counts of fraud and theft and money laundering. Uh, he was also a guest on uh, Dan Abrams Live just this hour. Take a look. Do you think your scandal hurt the Republican Party in the special election? Absolutely not. Last year in 2023, we had local elections. Every single Republican incumbent in NY3 was reelected and we flipped two seats locally from blue to red that historically had been blue. So George Santos does not affect the bottom line of anyone in NY3. And I think that's been proven last election. And I think it'll be proven tonight. Oh, well, um, no matter what about tonight, Santos is due to stand trial in September, which makes him again part of this show. Uh, his old seat is uh, going to be up, up for grabs again in the November election. So this is just a little holdover space. Um, my colleague uh, Leland Vitter joins me now with more. Leland, one of the things I couldn't believe that um, Santos said on Dan's show was that he'd actually kind of be happy if a Dem got it, just to kind of stick it to the Republicans who tossed him out. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't even know what to say about it. You just take it away. <laughs> well, he, he, got, he got his wish, right? And I think you were right to point out um, that the weather played an enormous role of this because the Democrats have done an amazing job of getting people to the polls uh, for the early early voting and doing the absentee ballots. Um, and Republicans had hoped to make it up on Election Day and then the snowstorm hit and uh, things ended here pretty, uh, pretty early. Tom Swazi now winning. Uh, in a larger sense, Ashley, I think you're right to bring up that, that George Santos is, sort of makes everything larger than life and his lies and his embellishments and sort of the, the game of the psychological warfare he played and occupied in everybody's mind, both in Washington and then um, in the media for a long time, uh, plays into this. Uh, in the end, this came down to another issue, uh, which was crime. Uh, immigration, which has become an enormous issue in New York City, as you know, uh, and in, in larger New York, in the New York metropolitan area, that played a huge role in this election. Uh, and the crime committed by uh, the illegal immigrants who had come in, particularly the beating of the NYPD cops uh, a couple of weeks ago played a large role in this race. It was not enough um, for the Republican to overcome what was a pretty significant Democratic machine. Huge amounts of money, uh, $15, $20 million of outside money spent just on this race. They were hiring snowplows today uh, to bring voters uh, to the polls. Mm. A lot of Dems don't like the crime uh, in New York either. So there's a bit of a sea change there for, I'm sure, many of them. But I just love the fact that he said, I'm not done yet. Still wants to be in politics, he said. So um, how about you and I make a date for the crime story that we're going to cover with George Santos when he has to stand trial in September? And then we'll talk again with whatever his next step is going to be. How does that sound? Leland? Pop the popcorn. All right. Thanks, Leland. By the way, I should mention that crime is technically down 4% in New York, but you can always cherry pick those numbers as to whether it's murder or whether it's, you know, people getting dragged by those motor scooters or being, uh, you know, shot at in, in Times Square. Things are looking pretty ugly on the headlines alone. OK, still to come on this show. In the 80s and the 90s, the biggest names in wrestling included Mr. Perfect, the Million Dollar Man, King Kong Bundy, and The Undertaker. And one man fought them all, Mario Mancini. He spent years as a scripted WWE wrestler, pulling his punches each and every night and making those men stars. But he is not pulling punches anymore. Tonight, he is breaking his silence about the allegations against Vince McMahon. He says as bad as they are, brace yourself. The worst is yet to come. That's next. You might
might not know the name Mario Mancini, but if you were a wrestling fan in the 80s and the 90s, you sure do know his work. In the WWE hierarchy, he was referred to what's called a jobber. A jobber is a wrestler who is there to make superstars look good. Mancini fought them all, and he lost to all of them too, convincing the fans that their heroes were larger than life. For the first time, The Undertaker ever set foot in the ring, Mario Mancini was there, waiting for him. From 1984 to 1992, Mancini was there for everything. Everything that went on at the WWE. He was in the ring, he was backstage, and he was on the road. In just a moment, Mario Mancini is going to join me for an exclusive interview about the latest allegations against Vince McMahon and the WWE and that whole empire and why he says the worst is yet to come. But first, it has finally happened. The very first public sighting of wrestling superstar Brock Lesnar since Janelle Grant filed that explosive lawsuit. Grant, as you may know, is the former WWE staffer who uh, claims, among other things, that Vince McMahon shared nude photos of her with a, quote, former UFC heavyweight champion whom WWE was actively trying to sign a new contract, end quote. The suit also alleges that Vince McMahon tried to sweeten the deal by offering Miss Grant up to the new recruit for sex. Incidentally, it does appear that the new recruit apparently did not engage. Many people suspect that that redacted champion was, in fact, Brock Lesnar. And yesterday, um, this photo was posted of Lesnar with his daughter Maya, a track and field star at Colorado State. He still hasn't made any public comments, and the WWE kind of seems now to be pretending that Lesnar doesn't exist. Diamond Dallas Um, Diamond Dallas Page, if you know that name, uh, gave an interview to the website um, Sports Kita, but he didn't seem to be giving much of anything here. This is the quote. I didn't read the complaint. I didn't see what was said. I've heard bits and pieces of it, and I wasn't there, bro. You'll never hear me comment on something that I wasn't there, and if I'm going to have a comment, I'm most likely going to say it right to the person's face. So they didn't hear, oh, DDP said this. Like, no, I didn't. For what it's worth, I wasn't there when Harvey Weinstein did what he did to all those women. I'm commenting on it. (laughs) I don't think most people witness rape. (laughs) I don't think most people witness most crimes. And you can still have an opinion. The Undertaker is one of the most famous WWE superstars of all time. He had a very close relationship with McMahon and says it's a very different WWE with McMahon's son-in-law, Triple H, now in charge of content. And here's his quote. When I was working full-time, or even when I wasn't, it was just so chaotic. I've seen Triple H get worked up, but I haven't seen him yell at talent. I haven't seen him badmouth anybody. Once again, um, we're not really talking about yelling at people. (laughs) Yelling is not the problem. Yelling is not illegal. The other stuff is. When Vince McMahon was in charge, the storylines were insane. And on occasion, they ventured into the kind of filth that is absolutely not fit for family entertainment. Take a look. Your mother had a certain reputation. Oh, boy. Oh. You, might, you might say she had a, uh, a good time girl reputation, if you get my drift. On the very first date, Stephanie, On the very first date, we had a really good time. Every time I went out to dinner with one of your business associates, I was 17 years old. You don't think they told me what you promised them I'd do? And guess what, Dad? I did it. I did it for you, the things I did with them, and I'm ashamed of myself. I'm ashamed of myself that I'm just like you. As for my qualifications... I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to show you. Yeah, it didn't age well. We should note that the WWE has a team of writers. It wasn't all Vince McMahon. Um, But the fact remains that he did appear in segments like you just saw with his real daughter. They might have been playing characters, but they were playing characters of themselves, using their names. 
using their family. Now back to the wrestling veteran, Mario Mancini. He spent almost a decade wrestling for the WWE, and he joins me live from his wrestling school, Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling in East Haven, Connecticut. Mario, really good of you to, uh, to join me tonight. I look at those clips, and look, they were kind of gross, and um, yeah, you know, they were, they, were, they were way too edgy even back then. But with these allegations, they are painful to watch. I'd like to get your thoughts. Well, listen, what you're showing is the Attitude Era. And they push the envelope a lot during the Attitude Era. And you have to remember, at, at that point, um, there was another company called WCW that was at, at some point was edging out the WWE uh, as far as ratings. So things got a little uh, out of control and out of hand in order to get ratings. And that's why it, was, it started. they started calling it the Attitude well, Era because... That's, you know, they, they push the that, envelope. Right, and that's what I want to get at. Is this pushing the envelope for ratings, or is there an element um, of this person on the tape that you see that's actually the real Vince McMahon? You knew him. Was this a character, or was this really him? Well, well listen, I, <laughs> you have to remember something. I'm what's called the, the, lowest, the lowest form on the wrestling food chain, right? You said it yourself. I was a jobber, and I appreciate you not calling me an enhancement talent because that just makes me feel like a human Viagra. So I'd rather be called a jobber. Um, so I had limited um, contact with Vince McMahon, but of course I didn't have any limited contact with all my friends in the dressing room, or nor did my eyes have any limited contact. But as far as one-on-one -on -one with him, you know, I, I, like you said, I was just the guy to go out there and, and sell my head off and, and make sure the guys look great. Um, but there are things over the years that I've watched that I've that really do match his his off who he really is. Who he really is. He's, you know. Well, listen, you, you've mentioned the words he's sadistic. Uh, you mentioned he's a sociopath. And then you said something that really made my jaw drop. You said what we've seen in this lawsuit is nothing. Like you ain't seen nothing yet oh. that you know of something yeah. specific that would blow the doors off this lawsuit. What do you mean? Well, well listen, <laughs> I don't want to end up in a court of law myself. So unless somebody comes forward with something like that, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm not going to come out and, and, and blast it out. But, you know, well, I did an article for, if you, if you read the New York Magazine article I did, at the end I said, you know, it was pertaining to Rita Chatterton, and, and I said, it, there's worse stuff than this. And then this came out recently, and I kind of said, well, here we go. And then that's when I made my comment of, guess what? Guess what? There's worse stuff than that. And the person's looking at me going, there's allegations of them defecating in somebody's head. There's something worse than that. I'm like, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is. <laughs> But, Listen, I, 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 understand, I understand you don't want to be up on, on defamation, but I, I, I got a couple seconds left only. But can you at least give me a hint of what it is you're referring to? Um, listen, all I can say is, you know, back in the 80s, um, it was the wild, wild west. You got to remember something. It was a privately owned company. Um, it was family owned. There were no rules. And, you know... Things just, things just happened. I, I really, I really can't even give a hint. I could never do that. It's, it's bad enough. I'm on here. What I'm doing, you need to know. What I'm doing is taboo. Nobody would, do, nobody would do this. Can you tell that, me this? It just Mario, doesn't can happen. Can you tell me this? What the, the material right. that you're saying is worse than what we've seen in the lawsuit? Did someone get hurt? Did multiple people get hurt? Um, I, I would think, over time probably from the late 70s to early 80s. Well, yeah, sure. Mario, we'll have to have you back. I understand the pressure you're under, um, but as things perhaps begin to get more clarity, um, you might be able to, to speak more freely, and I, I, hope we get that, I hope we get to that day. Thanks for doing this tonight. Really appreciate it. 
Oh, well, uh, look, thanks for having me on. I, I've been on a lot of, of podcasts and stuff, but I've never done, any, done anything of this magnitude. So, but yeah, this was huge. So I'm sorry we didn't have a, a, a lot of time, but. It's an understandable story still developing, and we'll certainly have you back. Mario Mancini, thank you. I also want to let our audience know um, that tomorrow I'll have two more exclusive interviews on this crisis. Paul Roma is a former WWE star who spent more than 10 years with the company working for Vince McMahon. I'll also be joined by the best friend of former WWE superstar and Playboy cover model, Ashley Massaro. In November of 2016, Massaro claimed she'd been sexually assaulted on a WWE trip to Kuwait. She alleged that McMahon and the WWE knew all about the attack, but decided to cover it up, something the WWE is denying. When she got back from the trip, her best friend says that Ashley told her everything about the alleged rape. Massaro died by suicide back in 2019, but that friend is going to join me for an exclusive interview tomorrow. And still to come on this program tonight, um, I've got one of those what would you do situations. Say somebody you love disappears without a trace and 20 years pass without a clue or an answer. Do you give up? Maura Murray's family says no way. Maura disappeared after her car crashed on a lonely road, but cops couldn't even find footsteps leading away from her car. The FBI thinks she might look like this today. That's Maura on the left. And that is an age-progressed picture on the right. Maura's big sister, Julie, joins me live next. One year after the East Palestine disaster, a community still in need of answers. We're being lied to, and I don't know why for sure. And only one network has committed to staying on the story from day one. News Nation's not going anywhere. News Nation, the first to report from America's backyards. These are real stories. Everybody is angry. And staying when all other networks leave. Thanks to News Nation for being the only national network committed. That's what it means to be news for all America. To find News Nation, go to joinnn.com. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has proposed a new set of rules to rein in what it calls excessive overdraft fees charged by banks. Currently, consumers are paying nearly $9 billion in overdraft fees, more than $2.3 billion to just 10 large banks in 2023. There's good news for sports fans. There's a proposed agreement on the table that would ensure video coverage of local and regional sporting events. Amazon may partner with Diamond Sports, using Prime to provide local coverage of Major League Baseball, the NBA, and the National Hockey League. There's a new trend that started on TikTok with children as young as 10 buying skincare products. One dermatologist in Washington, D.C. tells WTOP Radio that the trend may do more harm than good. She believes cosmetics firms are targeting preteens and encouraging the trend. I'm Mark Huffman. Learn more at ConsumerAffairs.com. The key to unlock the next breakthrough in cancer research could be sitting in your driveway. Stand Up to Cancer's vehicle donation program makes it easy to turn your unwanted vehicle into funding to support innovative cancer research. So when you're looking to get rid of your old car, truck, motorcycle, RV, or boat, why not donate it to Stand Up to Cancer? You can be a driving force in cancer research. Donate your car today. Visit StandUpToCancer.org slash cars to learn more. This message is brought to you by the Armed Forces Vacation Club, a free membership travel hub for active duty military and veterans. The club provides a well-deserved escape during challenging times or post-deployments or for cherished family moments. This exclusive travel club grants access to discounted seven-night resorts and savings on over 600,000 hotels, rental cars, and more. Discover the world for free at afbclub.com. Snakes, zombies, sharks, heights, speaking in public, the list of fears is endless. But while you're clutching your blanket in the dark, wondering if that sound in the hall was actually a footstep, the real danger is in your hand when you're behind the wheel. And while you might think a great white shark is scary, what's really terrifying and even deadly is distracted driving. Eyes forward, don't drive distracted. Brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. You're listening to Banfield on News Nation. To find News Nation on your screen, go to joinnn.com. At First Tee, we are building game changers. 
We believe all kids deserve to feel excited to grow, safe to fail, and better equipped for whatever comes at them next. We do this by helping them develop their golf swing, but more importantly, their inner strength. First Tee coaches help young people ages 7 to 18 navigate the course, as well as guide them through new challenges in life. Because we know what's inside doesn't just count, it changes the game. Learn more at firsttee.org. Substance use disorder and addiction is so isolating. And so as a black woman in recovery, hope must be loud. It grows louder when you ask for help and you're vulnerable. It is the thread that lets you know that no matter what happens, you will be okay. When we learn the power of hope, recovery is possible. Find out how at startwithhope.com. Brought to you by the National Council for Mental Well-Being, Shatterproof, and the Ad Council. Get a pep in your step, put up your chin with a grin. Antenna TV gives you the best life through television. Tune in day and night and live your best life through television. Television sets it quite the thing. Antenna TV, TV how it was meant to be. Behind almost every missing person or unresolved tragedy, there is a family waiting for answers. And Mara Murray's family has been waiting for 20 years now. This is Mara at age 21, the last time that her family saw her. She was a former West Point cadet turned nursing student and a standout athlete at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. On February 9th, 2004, that's 20 years and four days ago, she told her professor and a few others on campus that there'd been a death in her family and that she'd need to travel. Only no one in her family had died. She also withdrew almost all of her money from an ATM, and Maura Murray hit the road in her car. But three hours into that road trip, Maura wrecked out in a wooded spot way up in New Hampshire. And police got there, like, just within minutes of the witnesses who called 911. But here is where things go sideways. Mora was gone. Nowhere to be found. They found the wreck. They found the car. They found no footprints leading away from the car. The doors were locked. There was a box of wine in the back seat. But no Mora. I, I don't even want to ask the question, did she wander away? Because there were no footprints. Why? Why no tracks? Was she picked up by a stranger? Was she a victim of violence? Did she run away again? No footprints, nobody knows. I want you to take a look at this FBI uh, created age progressed photograph, predicting what Maura might look like today at age 41. And Maura's big sister Julie has launched a podcast that explores every detail of Maura's disappearance in hopes of maybe turning up some new lead, anything, anything new. First few episodes are out now. Here's Julie talking about the last time that the two sisters were together. Mara was 21 years old, a Dean's List student studying to be a nurse following in her mother Laurie's footsteps. I missed the entire previous year, so we had a lot of catching up to do. And that we did. Little did I know this would be the last time I would ever see my little sister Mara again. In a month's time, she would be ripped away from my life without warning, without reason. Nothing could prepare me for the next chapter. My life would never be the same. That is from episode one of the podcast called Media Pressure, the untold story of Maura Murray. And here is the face behind the voice, Julie Murray. That's Maura's big sister. Julie, thank you so much for being on the program. And I, mean, I, I didn't know until just recently that your podcast is number four on Spotify. I mean, it's only being bested right now by Joe Rogan, Tucker Carlson, and Jason and Kelsey, um, Jason um, and, and Travis Kelsey. It, I mean, it is, it is incredible that you're getting this much exposure. Is it turning into any leads or tips at this early point? Actually, it, it has. Um, within the first week of the podcast launch, we've already got several viable tips in that we're pursuing actively right now. And are the authorities who I, I assume have been working on the case, are they thrilled with the notion that they might have a new energy injected into the investigation? Well, I think they want to solve this case just as much as my family does. 
So it's just another tool, another technique to try to generate some new leads, maybe jog someone's memory. Um, but most importantly, it's to give my missing sister, Mara, a voice in her own story. I'm looking at the age progression. Um, to me, my goodness, she barely looks a year older, uh, let alone 20 years older. Do you think it's an accurate portrayal of what she might look like now? Honestly, I think I'm a more accurate uh, image of what she might look now because uh, we do look so similar. But it, it's a step in the right direction. It's not a bad thing. Um, the investigators told me it's just another tool. It's not based on new information. So it can't hurt. The, um, the most likely scenario, I, I hesitate to even ask, but I can only imagine that you and your family have gone over every possibility. I can't get over the, the fact that there were no footprints in the snow leading away from Maura's car. What do you and your family believe um, may have happened to your sister? We suspect foul play for two reasons. One, in two decades, there hasn't been a single credible lead. And two, nothing has ever been found. When you say foul play, I keep coming back to the footprints. What, what kind of foul play? Do you think she got into a passing vehicle and it just happened to be the worst coincidence ever that there was someone uh, with a nefarious intent that happened to be passing by that accident site? Based on the evidence, I believe she did get into a vehicle and eventually met with foul play. Do you know um, things about this investigation that the, that the public doesn't know? Have the police shared things with you and asked you not to share them publicly in hopes that it'll maintain some evidence that only the killer will know? I do know a few things um, that the police have shared with me that they asked me not to talk about or make public. And of course, I don't want to jeopardize my sister's investigation, so... Um, and I want to earn their trust. And we, we do have a much better relationship now within the past couple of years. So I want to continue to move forward in a collaborative way with the investigators. And Julie, I, you know, I may have spoken too um, loosely when I said only the killer would know, because, of course, we, we don't. We don't know if Maura was killed, but I have, you know, read that you do suspect she was killed. Again, based on, based on what I know, based on the evidence, um, we know that she didn't walk into the woods. There was over two feet of snow. We would have seen footprints. There was scent dogs, cadaver dogs, heat sensing, helicopter, line searches, and nothing has ever been found. So I don't think that she went into the woods for those reasons. Julie, let's stay on this. Um, it, it's, it's such a mystery, and I'm buoyed by the fact that your podcast is as popular as it is, that there are people out there who truly do you know, support you and want to help in, and reinvigorate this 20-year-old case. And let's like, pray that we can get something that will help your family get some answers and some closure. But I, d I do intend to, to speak with you again on this. I hope you'll come back. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Julie Murray joining us live. I mean, just phenomenal uh, mystery. Again, the podcast is Media Pressure. You can get that anywhere um, you find your podcasts. And it is, uh, it is remarkable, the story. Coming up next, um, if and when worse comes to worse, and I mean worse with a capital W, what's your plan? Do you have one, a plan? Some of your neighbors might if they're rich enough and concerned enough about, say, Armageddon. After a break, our Brian Enton is going to take us to an ultra-exclusive, super-expensive underground bunker that just might survive the end of the world if he can survive the night. He's live after this. You have found the most deluxe bunker cribs the world has to offer in Indiana? We have. We're going to take you inside, Ashley. We don't have a ton of time. We're in the middle of Indiana. We agreed not to say where we are, uh, but I want to quickly try to get you downstairs so you can see what this is like, Ashley, because it's pretty insane. Uh, there's basically this little building on top of the ground. You never know what it is, but you come inside here, and again, we're going to try to walk fast. Forgive. Uh, I'm sorry, Mo. Hopefully, uh, we'll make it down the stairs here. Come down deep under the ground here, Ashley, into the bunker. Um, around the corner, 
I gotta get this door open fast, which I wasn't planning on. It's like a big nuclear proof bomb blast door. You open and you would never know it. Come inside. This is the little security room. You come around the corner here. I already have claustrophobia. Nice bathroom here, Ashley. Uh, these are my, my bunker friends uh, who, who I met here. Everybody's hanging out. I just lost you on the IFB, so I'm gonna make this quick. This is the living area here. We just had pizza down here in the bunker. We're gonna have more for you tomorrow. Uh, and this is the little room that I'm gonna be sleeping in. So I can't hear you, Ashley, uh, but this is where I'm gonna end up. Uh, and uh, we'll have more for you tomorrow from, from the bunker, Ashley. Oh man, I can't wait because I love these kinds of bunkers. I can tell our audience, Brian, that this is called the cruise ship. It sleeps uh, 80 people, 10,000 square feet. You have to have a boatload of money in order to get yourself one of these things. Brian's going to have all the details. He's going to survive the night. He's going to sleep. I was getting agita just going down that far underground. All right, so tomorrow, Brian, with the full report on these amazing uh, end of times bunkers. In the meantime, stick around. Cuomo's next. They are the oldest people ever to run for president, breaking by only four years the record that they set. <laughs> no less than Jon Stewart making his return to The Daily Show last night, nine years later. And he's going somewhere that...